the Vincent Thierrybon, uh, the collaborator, um, he, he works at the Pierce Institute uh, in New Haven, and this is Evan Park, and he's the student that has mainly done uh, most of the work in the last five years, and he just graduated last week. Pretty good result. I hope. Uh, there's another person that I should have put here, uh, Dr. Kim. Um, most of them we have that I don't know that also have experience in the sensors. Yeah, it helped us a lot. So, okay, so for us, uh, for us the, big, uh, the big problem that uh, we want to work on is basically trying to uh, understand the uh, neural processing. So we're very interested, for example, in, uh, in sensor processing, especially vision. So how do we perceive the world? What can we do? Uh, what kind of computation do we have to do? What kind of models do we? Uh, it turns out that a lot of it, uh, a lot of the latest advances in this field are uh, bio-inspired models, so models of visual systems that take uh, uh, into account biology of mammals because we pretty much have the best computer system out there. Um, so it makes sense to try to study neuroscience to extract algorithms that then one day you could uh, replicate in app. But for example, if you wanted to have a robot that sees as well as you or drives your car and so on. Uh, but right now we're going to mainly talk about uh, this, this idea. So, uh, in the visual cortex, like in many, many other sensory sensory areas, uh, you're you're dealing with a multi-layered network. It's a vision, a very large network is what it involves almost a third of the brain, uh, various various areas. Uh, so uh, that's a really huge network. And if you really want to understand what it does, um, you really need to look at a large number of neurons in real time, or at least select the select one. For example, if you were to look at the second layer uh, in the visual cortex, you know, the third layer, some of the middle layer in the visual cortex, <coughs> they say you want to know what the neuron in B2 or B4 does, then you probably have to record from several tens of thousands of neurons to really figure out what the uh, transfer function of that uh, neuron is. Um, what do you guys think? Maybe oh, yes, maybe hopefully not. Hopefully not that many. Huh? I said hopefully not that many. Yeah, not that many. So There's always going to be a question. Yeah. So depending on how you program, same signal can have a different result, <coughs> different reading? Oh no, here I'm talking yeah. about uh, your visual cortex and trying to figure out what it does. Yeah. So yeah, if I want to figure out what it does... So you have a program here, right? Yeah. So the idea is... Depending on who it, how they wrote it, they have different results, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, maybe. No, what I'm trying to say is that I want to extract the algorithm. What does this neural network do? Um, uh, and if you want to do this uh, uh, right now, today, uh, you basically have, you know, in order to look at large, large number of cells in the brain, you have maybe two options. Um, one of them is fMRI. And that crescent, which is getting better and better, but still, I think he likes the temporal resolution, especially, and it's getting close to the spatial resolution um, to look at uh, you know, individual colors in the cortex, for example. Uh, the other alternative is microelectrode array, um, like the one here. I think this is still a 10 by 10 array, so 100, 100 electrodes. Utah, uh, that I think is still one of the most used, basically, device to record from a large number of new. Um, and the idea here is that you can insert this kind of needle in the brain, um, and each one of these electrodes, uh, in theory, is able to uh, identify multiple neurons around it, but it doesn't know specific, <coughs> it doesn't know where exactly the thing lands. And I never, I was never a big fan of these electrodes because they sort of damage the same. But very efficiently, you're trying to study. Um, and uh, although there's no real, real evidence right now that this rapid behavior, you know, is that. 
so we, we were trying to look for something something different, and that's when um, basically met met Vincent. So, in my opinion, at least for the work that we do, uh, modeling of visual system, you really need to record from many many cells if you want to un understand what a neuron is. So let's say P2 or P4 is doing, and right now we don't have any tools to do that. And although there's there's some tricks and things that you can do and. I think Kevin and I are the best people to, to really extract a lot of information from just a few, few uh, electrons. Um, so I, I met Vincent uh, a few, you know, about six, six, seven years ago. Um, he introduced me to uh, his uh, voltage sensitive uh, recording of the brain. So this was the before really autogenetic became a boom really, but it was a you know a couple of years before maybe. And uh, the idea of all the sensitive dyes is that you inject the dye in the brain of an animal. The animal has to be anesthetized, restrained, and you use um, this dye is uh, sensitive to the voltage changes in the in the membrane, so it's a fast dye of a microsecond speed. Um, and you can basically solve spike, uh, spike resolution um, in the cortex with a fairly high, uh, in a fairly light, high, large area. Because here, for example, you're looking at something like five by five millimeters or more cortex. Uh, the only problem with these techniques is that the animal had to be anesthetized, and, uh, and um, he was basically sleeping. So you know that if you're sleeping. Uh, you're obviously thinking about very different things when you're away. So I tried to run an experiment here um, with the animal sleeping was not ideal. Uh, ideally, you want the animal really moving and behaving. Uh, and if you, you know, if you really want to know what he's doing when he senses the specific environment and so forth, uh, you really need to have the animal moving around and you have to record from the somatic sensory cortex. Uh, but this system was uh, so big and bulky that it was hard to really uh, miniaturize. At least nobody has tried before. Uh, so this technique, uh, you know, with all the sensitive dyes, uh, gives you beautiful movies like this one of the somatosensory cortex, for example. Um, if you flicker a whisker of the mouse, uh, and you look at the barrel cortex, you can see each individual barrel behind uh, by the spools. So you can really look, uh, you're looking down at the brain, so you get a, a 2D projection, sort of like a, a glorified fMRI, but you get a projection of the cortical activity in, the, in that area. So this is called, you're, you're seeing columns basically being activated. And this can give you an idea of you know, the size of receptive field, uh, the, the how many cells are evolving, uh, what's the depth, you know, the spatial depth of resolutions are. And it, it can give you an idea to constrain these models. If you try to make a neural network model, then it can give you an idea of saying how many cells do I have to put on the second layer, uh, how big are my filters, uh, how fast do they have to respond, and so forth. Um, yeah. Do you have an idea of how deep your signal is? Yeah, so this, uh, oh, don't worry, I'll get it. Yeah, this, uh, um, you're looking, you're basically looking down into, into the cortex, so you're mostly looking at your own six, six, six layer, layer, maybe you're getting something of, of the opposite, yeah, one or two or three, I guess. Maybe you're getting to four if you, you know, if you're, uh, the animal brain is uh, is that you get scattered in the, the cells in, inside the inside of the scanner wall. Also, this this thing with the voltage sensitive dyes is uh, is mostly um, presynaptic. It looks at like presynaptic activity because uh, most of the, the most of the depolarizations. Uh, happens around uh, at the axon. 
looking at uh, basically a synaptic activity or looking mostly. Uh, and this is something that, for example, you can do. So you can obtain these nice movies that you, you couldn't really do with the lighters because if you put an electron, it, it corresponds to a pixel, but you don't really know what it came from. Right? Uh, and so you can see things like this, for example, these are sort of spontaneous waves in, in awake animals. You can see with these techniques. It's sort of, uh, they, to me, they seem like uh, mod potential modulation in the somatosensory cortex, you know, trying to figure out what uh, relevant is there. So you can get uh, beautiful movies like this, give you a lot more information uh, than uh, you know, sparse electrons. So basically, our goal was to design a miniaturized system like the one you've seen, um, where I have an LED that can stimulate uh, the dyes or the optogenetic or genetically modified cells. Um, and you would have uh, a miniature camera that can capture that signal. And this uh, should be, you know, more or less as small as a conventional uh, microelectrode array. I'm, I'm showing here a large one with a lot of electrodes. If you guys have something smaller, you know, or less one. Well. Something that, you know, would not bother the animals too much. So it's as small as possible, and as light as possible. Especially if you want to use it in mice, in rats, uh, it's a nice little problem. Um, so here I have a very small movie that you can see more or less what the technique is. Um, this device is, and this is the real device that we designed. So you have an LED here, uh, and uh, the LED is going to turn on. It's always on, actually. It's not really false. So the LED is always on. It stimulates this area where you have uh, all the sensitive dye or the voltage encoded dye. And, and then uh, this light that is, uh, the light that comes out is basically modulated by neural activity. So if you look at the modulation of this, uh, this light over that area, you can, uh, you can get a sense of uh, neural activity in that area, basically the 2D projection from this layer in the dimension 1, 2, 3, all this. So in, uh, recently, uh, in, at the beginning, we were using uh, all the sensitive dyes, um, but the recent investigation of the model of work in uh, devising new molecules uh, of really optogenetic, not for stimulation, but for recording, really. So you, you're trying to inject um, the same protein that some marine mammals have, uh, fluorescent proteins. Into, into the mammalian cortex cells, for example, and try to make them fluoresce. And there's, a, for that, you basically have to study uh, the genetic code of these cells, the marine cells, and try to figure out which one gives you the, the highest response, uh, a specific wavelength, for example, which one is fast, which one is slow. And there's so many probes right now. Uh, you know, calcium, calcium dyes, the GFP, and so forth. And right. you guys are more the expert than me. Uh, and Vincent is definitely, Vincent, uh, the guy who's supposed to be here. So one, uh, maybe the, the largest percentage of his work is really to the, the design these uh, voltage sensors, uh, try to even dives in the ocean and try to find animals, and then uh, find the right genes, uh, and then, uh, you know, translates them into mice, uh, genetically modifies the mice to, to record it. So he's working on all this. And he's not the only one. There's a big group in Janelia Farms, for example, at MIT and all of Stanford, all over the place, right? A lot of people working on this because it's really the only trail, right? So if you could, uh, if you can see, if Neuron can, uh, can show you different lights, activity, you know, then you just have to look at them. Um, and you don't have to, to you know, mechanically penetrate the, the tissue. So this, um, um, this is, for example, what you will see with one of these probes in a neuron. So they're, they're so fast that you can see propagation through the axons. Uh, if you really zoom in, uh, 
Um, so they're really great for for studying you know, uh, productivity. Now, in here is uh, one of these uh, uh, all the sensitive dyes that is uh, basically uh, a protein that sits across the membrane uh, in the NES. Here you can see some kind of a thread, thread pair um, where you have uh, energy transfer between, between two molds. Uh, and that's what Vincent is studying recently, trying to figure out which one gives you the fastest response. So you want to see something fast. Because you want to record spikes, right? So spikes are on the order of milliseconds or so. You want to get a score, you know. You want to record a second or more if you can. And this is the best probe that he has um, uh, right now. It's called the light. Light hack. Uh, so you can see uh, basically uh, what you can do. So this is the best prop that they, they found recently. Uh, so these are single faces, and there's no temporal or spatial filtering at all you know, over, over the cells. Uh, and you can see basically uh, when you st when you stimulate uh, the cells, you match the cell, and you stimulate it with the little holes. Uh, and then you can see uh, the output basically uh, uh, from, from this cell really well. Uh, and these are also, the, the signal of these cells uh, is uh, it's very, very high, it's 35%. So this delta F over F is basically the amount of change over the back, background. So I get F light, what's the delta, what's the change that I see? So the bigger is this delta F, the better it is because I'm gonna I'm gonna see the signal with higher signal to noise ratio. Right? Uh, and 35 is really huge. I mean, usually with all the sensitive dyes, we've uh, you know we had uh, maybe a third or even less than that. And you have to you have to understand that this is basically this is looking at a single neuron, so you're focusing on the neuron. When you look at the cortex, right? Um, there's not just neurons, a lot of other things where uh, that gets genetically modified, right? And so, unless you find, you know, very specific probes, in the case of both the sensitive dyes, for example, you detect the dye would go everywhere, uh, you know, on the, not just on the neurons, but the real cells and everything else. And there's, you know, there's a order, there's a ratio of, uh, and other cells to one you will write more or less in the brain. So imagine you would be getting 10 times signal from other cells that don't change. And, uh, and the neuron only, uh, for, you know, only give you like a 10% of the, the uh, population. So, so if, if you get 35% from a single neuron, you would get 3.5 more or less. You have to divide it by 10. Uh, from, from the corpus. So it's not really high, 3%. It's not huge. Um, so this is uh, this shows what I was telling you about. So if you're looking at the corpus, right, you're going to have, a, you know, when you turn on the light, you're going to have a huge background, and then you have a little tiny signal on top. This signal can be, you know, a few percent, basically, of the entire life. So what you, you need, basically, if you want to record this signal, you need a sensor that has a very high dynamic range because you have to capture all the signal and then you're going to throw away all the most significant bits and just keep the least significant bits. So you need something that has, you know, high SNR, so more than 12 bits resolution in a camera. Um, and you need to go fairly fast. You need to have you know, 500 strikes per second, 1,000, even more if you can. You need to be lightweight. You also need to be fairly low power because you don't want to uh, heat up the tissue or the animal to support uh, that at all. So that are disadvantages. So just as a comparison, uh, we need approximately 10 bits. And uh, the DSLR, you know, the best cameras that you can buy, they, they give you about 10 for, for or less, and, uh, and they can go to 500 frames per second. So it was obvious that we had to design our own camera. So if you look at what's available now, 
So this is the DSLR, so the best you know, camera to take pictures. Uh, this is a mobile camera that you want on your the iPhone cell, you know, on your cell phone, basically. Um, and these are two cameras that were used in voltage sensitized imaging. So if I go back here, uh, this camera here, that were that are commercially available. There's, there's very few. They're also very large. So most of them consume 100 watts and they make this beat. And they need a processor to collect all the data. So it, it wasn't something that we could just uh, buy and use. It be something smaller. Uh, these DSLR mobile camera, they have a poor signal to noise ratio, so not enough, and they don't go very fast. They do 10, 10 or 30 pens per second. Also, you know, they're fairly large sets, so they have 10 megapixels. We don't really need 10 megapixels. It would be nice to have it. But... Uh, these cameras, instead, you know, they have a very large uh, dynamic range. But again, yeah, they're just too small. So we have to make basically, oh, and this one too, this is another camera that is a little bit better, more, more recently. Um, and again, uh, it was uh, available like in the cheap lab. <laughs> then, you know, nobody's making, nobody, you can't find these cameras on the market because nobody cares about fast camera with a lot of bits. Uh, because most, you know, most people just care about taking pictures. For that, you're okay with the, you know, eight to ten bits, uh, really. And uh, they want a lot of pixels. And a lot of pixels for us is bad because it makes the pixel really tiny. Right now, it's less than a micron. Um, and if the pixel is tiny, it's a lot of light uh, to uh, to really get a good signal. Um, so. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, the dynamic range of the pixel is fairly low. So, so these are basically, you know, this is what you can buy. I can go to Samsung, for example, and say, hey, can you, can you sell me a camera 500 frames per second for this? We have to, so we have to build our own. Um, so luckily, um, we were, you know, our expertise was designing integrated circuits. So designing a camera is, is not very difficult because uh, once you have an integrated circuit, uh, all you can do is uh, you can do an end diffusion, you know, which is something typical that we do in pay transition, for example, uh, in, uh, in your wafer. Uh, your wafer is P, this area is N, and this P injection is basically a photodiode. And a photodiode of this kind is uh, luckily because silicon is perfect for uh, optical absorption. And um, is um, is basically um, the main element that all of you guys have in your cell phone. So most of you have a uh, injunction like this. It's optimized for your vision support. So you put these two regions together, they create a depletion region. So when a when a photon hits these depletion regions, it, it creates two charges, and then we read, we can read those charges basically. That's our our this is for for primer on, uh, on cameras. <laughs> and then uh, um, there's a pixel architecture. So this is this is a photodiode, right? Uh, if you want to create a camera, you have multiple options. So you can either uh, read out the photodiode current directly, okay? or you can have an active pixel that basically has a little amount of voltage amplifier here. Um, and uh, you can have basically the same thing, a voltage amplifier, but you can have an optimized uh, photo detector here where the depletion region is a little buried and it looks kind of like a CCD. I mean, without going into technical details, I'll just tell you that this pin photodiode is basically what you have in your, in your cell phone cameras most of the times. Even in high-end DSLR, there are some CMOS cameras. Passive are not good, they have too much noise. Um, and this is the one that we can easily do in most uh, processes. So this is basically what we, you know, the final, the final uh, product of the design, you know, after, after five years of work. Um, it was basically miniature microscope, like the one that you've seen um, in this, these figures. There's a light source, the photo you know, heat the dissipator around the light source because the LED we use is a fairly high power. 
uh, up to a 5 watt LED, uh, depending on how much illumination you really need. Sometimes you really need a lot of illumination. In fact, the more illumination you have, the more signal you get. The more signal you have, the more signal to noise ratio you can get, usually. So it's, it's beneficial. Uh, and then this is our camera uh, that is uh, inserted into a little uh, case, casing. And this is, these are images of the animal with the mounted camera. And this is, uh, you know, it looks like we're, we can do, easily do now the experiments with the moving red. In reality, this is not, not a, you know, it's not completely done. There's still a lot of work here in reducing the wires and trying to figure out who this thing to be in a cage for it. It's a lot of work I mean, just to set up an experiment. So this uh, this mouse was not moving very much. But, you know, we're getting there. So this is our uh, first cast uh, of image sensor that we did um, about uh, three to four years ago. Uh, basically a three transistor pixel so uh, it's similar to this active active pixel sensor here uh, it has a little voltage amplifier inside uh, it was a 32 by 32 element with a 40 by 40 micron photo um, and it was designed on a chip process so it wasn't really an optical process or anything but it was just a, just to get an idea of what we can do um, and then we designed a board that has an external D2D converter and then the uh, bias generation for the whole system. And it was capable of about a thousand frames per second. By the way, 32 by 32 pixel array already give you, you know, all, practically a thousand uh, elements. So that's, uh, that's already practically an order of magnitude more than what you can get with the next array. This at the time. Um, so we characterized it. We did. We ran all the technical characterization. I won't bore you with everything, but uh, basically uh, the conversion gain was low. Conversion gain is uh, um, how much voltage do I get per electron? You know, so it's uh, how sensitive is the camera? This camera was not designed in a fancy process, so it wasn't too sensitive. That's why we had to make the photo diode big, so we could collect more photos. Um, and because we made the photo like the big, it has a, had a huge well capacitance, so you could collect a lot of photos before it saturates. Um, so that was good because if you have a lot of light illumination, you want a big well because you need to contain all these photons, otherwise you can't collect. Um, but the noise was not great. You know, of course, uh, there's nothing you can do about short noise. So the bigger you make your, your uh, well capacitance, the more photos you can collect. But the shot noise is the square root of that. So there's nothing we can do about this. Um, but the signal, but if you have a big well, uh, because your uh, signal goes up with, uh, you know, with that number and the noise with the square root, you still, you still win anyway, making a big well all the time. Um, and then we had the reset noise of about 500 electron and a reset noise of, you know, uh, so the total noise was about 2,000 electrons. So just as a comparison, like the best scientific cameras, if you run them at one frames per second, and uh, you know they can go down to close to one electron noise. So this is a lot more noise, of course. But it's normal because you have to go faster. We had a lot more time, so, so different, different story. Nevertheless, this was enough um, to run a few experiments. So for example, we ran about the sensitive play experiment. Um, exactly the same, you know, staying in the barrel cortex, exactly the same as the little movie that I showed you at the beginning. Um, and we record that with our camera, what we call the NeuroView, and, uh, and then we had the Neuro CCD, which was a commercial camera, the big one that you couldn't even face. Right? So this one here, this is the Neuro CCD. And as you can see, we were getting fairly similar results. We had more. We had a little bit more noise, of course, because we didn't have as much signal to noise ratio. We had to do some compromise because it's a small, small camera. But um, the results are fairly, fairly similar. And this is a 5% change in, uh, this is approximately 1% change in, um, in, in 
uh, in density. So it's it's a fairly fairly low signal. With the best with the probes that we have nowadays, you know, from Vincent, this is uh, easily four to five times larger. So if we're looking at that, we did a, uh, a cell image. We're looking at a single cell that was patched to uh, run a whole step uh, the current year. And then we want to look at basically a uh, visualization of these cells here uh, with uh, with our camera. And you could really see uh, the signal is easily, even though it's about a 1.5% uh, cell type of array. This was done at about uh, 330 frames per second. So the experiment was done at 500 frames per second. Um, and this is, by the way, this is a 2 by 2 pixel average. So I look at 4 pixel and I just average and look at a single, single trial. This is a 4 by 4 pixel average because I think that's the least, that's the minimum that this camera can do. Um, and this one was just a single trial. But, sorry, it was averaged over this, this area here, the cell here. You know, maybe um, five by five feet. Uh, and then we ran. Um, we we found a collaborator in, in Japan that was studying the visual cortex. I was really interested in the visual cortex. I wanted to wanted to use this camera for uh, studying the visual cortex. So uh, we worked with these people in Japan that were studying the visual cortex. And they saw our camera and they said, "Oh, that's great. We want to want we need to try it." Uh, and um, uh, yeah, the visual system of, of um, rodents is, is quite different from, from ours. In fact, there's still a debate, really. I mean, we have a multi-layer network, uh, you know, V1, V2, V4, ID, with compact vortex, and so forth. Um, they, um, they have um, a slight, slightly different, well, fairly different visual system. There's a big uh, V1 region, and then there's a lot of other region around it. But it's not clear still, you know, at least from the last uh, few papers that I read, it, it wasn't clear exactly if um, um, if it was a multi-layer cortex like ours. So you get data from the first layer, then the second, and the third, and you know you basically have this hierarchical network, or or if it was more like I get in in the red cortex, if I get data into V1, and then in parallel I send it to all the other. So was it a serial process or a parallel process? So this guy is, uh, I mean, this is a simple experiment. It didn't really reveal anything, unfortunately. But it just shows you the, the, the power of, the, of this technique. So they inserted an electrode in V1, they stimulated in V1, and then we're looking at the lateral media uh, area, which is one of the major protections of V1, which is part of as, uh, the top of the ventral, ventral pathway recognizing things. So we, you know, we send the 10 pulse, you know, 10 pulse, five, five, five facing pulses in here if we want. And then they record with our camera in, in the lab. And this is what you what you see basically as soon as you, you um, produce this V1 stimulation, then uh, you still, you know, this movie of activity that protects you know, from, from lateral in the lab. So these are the kind of things you can see in the cortex with our camera. Now one, one has to do some you know, more bigger studies there to figure out uh, what cell you're stimulating and uh, figure out what the lab gets activated and record from the lab and so forth. This was just a simple test. Um, and you can see, so this is uh, uh, the signal that we were getting with our camera. And this is the signal that you were, they were getting with their own uh, me, my hand camera, another big one. Um, so if this one was going faster, and uh, the noise is comparable, you have a little more noise, I think. The, the kind of uh, signal that you get is, is fairly similar. So this is a comparison, basically, of the first prototype that I showed you a little bit twice. Uh, we just wrote a paper uh, to summarize everything, but it's basically 
compared to the other cameras or standard cameras, you know, we, we designed something that is a few grams, so very light, without the optics. I was consuming the product with the lens. It's a very interesting lens of the And it was able to run uh, close to uh, 1,000 frames per second with a large well. And the problems here were, you know, we had a low quantum efficiency because our light was not really optimized, not really great. And because of that, we had a small conversion rate. So we didn't, you know, our diode again is not the best. So then uh, we designed uh, recently last year a um, new, new camera. So this was supposed to be the real deal. Last time I came to give a talk here, um, we, we were basically here. Uh, so the last uh, year, year and a half, we designed and fabricated this camera. This is version of the first one. Uh, because if you, you know, if you design chips and you make a little mistake, then that's it. You gotta do it again. That's one of the problems. Um, this time we chose an uh, uh, opto, opto electronic processor, something that had a nice photo okay, So this is what uh, they use to run. Cameras. It's not the best of the best, it's not Samsung, but um, it's close enough. It's a slightly older process, but we didn't care because we need to make big photodiodes anyway. We need to integrate a lot of signal. This time our, our pixel was uh, a quarter of the size, even less, 30 micron pixel, even 20 micron photodiode. So this time we made a 10, 100 by 100 array. So this is a 10,000 channels. Uh, optical neural recording system. Uh, and this time we, we designed an architecture that's a pixel array, and then it was basically for every column in parallel you would compute uh, the standard and noise uh, reduction techniques, so, so related double sampling. And we had an internal analog to digital converter that we could run as a single slope so that we didn't have to rely on an external component to so reduce the components, the wires, and so forth. Didn't really happen in this first prototype. Just you know, prototype, so you need to test them. So. But uh, on the next one, we probably can run this whole thing with uh, just uh, you know, like the 10 wires or so forth, for example. And if you want to make your animal go around, you need wires or wires that can go around with the cable. Um, so, yeah, this sensor was basically um, a similar three transistor pixels. Same kind of pixel, just the diode is a little bit better than an optical process. Um, and then we had um, a gain circuit that was doing those cancelling offsets. And we had a single slope analog to digital converter. So uh, the way this works is basically this I compare. We run a, a digital staircase and an analog staircase. And we compare when, uh, when this staircase hits your signal. And then we uh, we use the value of the digital staircase as basically a conversion. So it's a simple data converter, but it's pretty fast and you can do it on every column. So here we had a hundred of this that need to be converted one per column. And then there was a biasing circuit, I won't bore you with these things, but uh, so in overall we got a conversion gain that was about ten times better than the previous one. That's because the whole detector was better, you know. And also, they, you know, in a regular process, they have a lot of metal layers and other things on top. This, this one is that they, they use few metal layers, so they, all the light goes in and doesn't get reflected back. Uh, the well size was smaller because we had a smaller photodiode. So, of course, you get, you know, the root of that is the shot noise. In overall, we had approximately a quarter, you know, one. Four times less noise, basically. And uh, the signal to noise ratio here was more than 50, so it was what we needed. Um, but then, unfortunately, when we tried to use an internal biasing, so, you know, reduction of wires, basically, then uh, we, we didn't get as, a, as, as good as a result. So we need to fix that in the next iteration, probably. Um, and the quantum efficiency of this photodiode you know, was fairly, fairly good. It was also 50, 50 more percent as opposed to 20 of the previous one. That's why we're getting much better.
Yeah, and then we, we just uh, arrived some tests uh, recently in the last uh, three months. Um, basically, uh, this is on uh, on single cells. Again, edge cell hack hex cells. Um, uh, this cell was patched, and then we were doing 100 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, 100 millivolt polarization uh, with a big setup. Okay, we were just testing the camera with a big microscope and so forth. Uh, and we were getting um, really good signals as well, you know, with the, the, you know, this is the delta F over F of 3 or 4, so it's a pretty large signal. Uh, and here you have uh, the same setup, basically with a different probe. Um, these are not the super fast, the fastest probes uh, that Vincent that, um, has. These are just the GFP, GFP based probes that are a little bit slow. You can see that the temporal resolution here is like he has faster ones than the one I showed you. Just didn't use them with the camera at the time. But um, so you can see the signal that we would get if you stimulate five milliseconds or ten milliseconds, ten milliseconds. And then this is the signal that you would get with a you know with your uh, DSLR camera if you had one. Um, you would get something like this that would this basically give you the baseline only. If you run the camera at faster frames per second, then you can start seeing you know, the depolarization of the cell as well. Um, yeah, and uh, so as a comparison, there's another group in uh, uh, Stanford, uh, a guy that has the 20 post or something like that. Um, and it's funny because <coughs> we, were, we were actually funded by the same person. And um, a few years ago, I was telling him about this project. He said, said, you know, why, why, why would you wanna, why would you wanna uh, uh, use a camera embedded than you know, just use a, a, a bunch of uh, optical fiber to get the signal out? And in fact, that's what he was doing. And then recently, he basically had an article that was very similar to us because that that you know that system was very hard to move uh, to Oriental. Anyone was moving around with these fibers, a lot of fibers, and fibers do not have very nice optical apertures. So anyway, um, at the end, they designed a sensor with a commercial sensor, so it was limited by speed and uh, dynamic range. Uh, so we had something that would go at 30 frames per second, we can do 500. Um, and uh, the signal-to-noise ratio was not really quite enough to do the same things. Yeah, so in summary, what we did was uh, we designed a low-power miniaturized version of, uh, of a fully autogenetic neural recording system. Um, the experimental data is as good as large commercial camera, given you know, the constraints. Um, we enabled in vivo experiments with this camera. We can use it with uh, animals. And right now we have 100 times more recording sites than an actual array, so that's the order of magnitude. Um, so things to think about for the future. Uh, one is that in vivo gives you larger signal because if the animal is sleeping, the signal are, are, are down. Uh, so if we're gonna, if, if the animal is, is alive and, and moving, you're gonna get a lot more signal. So that's good, better SNL. Uh, then CMOS camera have into temporal difference and subtract frames. Um, we included some of these characters already, but we still haven't tested. So we need to do some more work there to uh, basically do computation, reject what we don't want at the sensor. And we need better process. So we were fabricating the next one with the Samsung, the DSLR process of the best, the best of the best process, basically. Um, we have a compromise in optics, so there's not much you can do because it has to be small and light, so you have to make them out of plastic and so on. Um, and, um, you know, again, this technique gives you a project, uh, projection of the column activity and just on the, the first few layers that we talked about, like one, two, three, and so forth. So, your, if you care about what happens inside the column, then this is not really going to help you too much. Also, if you care about the output of the column, right, layer four, then you know, that's not exactly what you're getting. So, think about this. Um, but yeah, I mean, if any of you guys 
are interested, uh, I think, uh, you biomedical engineers, so if you care about understanding the brain, I think uh, uh, we definitely need you to think and, and work on how much they can scale up and record from a large number of cells, uh, because uh, without those tools, uh, it's going to be hard. It's like uh, if I open my TV and I use a little voltmeter and try to figure out how it works. Uh, I don't think it's good. But um, yeah, so these are people from uh, from the lab in the few past few years. I mean, most of them contributed in a way or, or another because they helped with the tools. These are all the you know recent graduate students here at Yale and uh, all the previous people and family. Uh, thank you for your attention. Now, unless you make a modification of the system that you can insert, but eh, so for example, auditory cortex humans is just maybe out of the question right now. But visual, you know, visual areas, you, yeah. So anything superficial right now, basically. Yeah, so what what are the, can you elaborate on the technical challenges for getting something deeper? Well, so. This, uh, so this technique here, the voltage sensitivity technique, is uh, one, of the, one of the problems of this, you know, is that it's hard because you have to physically uh, pin the skull, you have to leave the door and charge, for example, and then you, you shouldn't damage any, if you damage any blood vessel, then you're, you're not going to see a feature because of all that, they're going to absorb all the time. So, so that's one of the complexities. If you want to go, so for a, for a 